So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Valerie Scott, and I am the BSR librarian. I'm delighted to present this evening's lecture for a number of reasons. Firstly, because our speaker tonight is Claire Hornsby, an art and architectural historian who was formerly assistant director at the BSR. She works on the 18th century, specializing in the Grand Tour and the antiquities markets between Rome and Britain. And she published a book, Digging and Dealing in 18th Century Rome in 2010 with the late Ilaria Bignamini. With Mario Bevilacqua, director of the Centro di Studi sulla Cultura e l'Imagine di Roma, she's currently editing a volume of essays on Cardinal Alessandro Albani, which will be published at the end of this year. As a BSR research fellow and working again with Mario Bevilacqua, in partnership with the Biblioteca Nazionale Centrale di Roma and the Académie de France Villa Medici, she's organizing the postponed celebration for the 300th anniversary of the birth of Giovanni Battista Piranesi in 1720, which is taking the form of a three-day international conference online from the 19th to the 21st of May. And the second day will be held and hosted by the BSR. It's also a great pleasure for me because the subject of Claire's talk tonight is one of the treasures in our rare book collection. And her research has revealed that it's even more interesting than we thought. And lastly, for our BSR Digital Collections website, together with Claire, we've prepared a new highlight relating to her research, and you will have an introductory preview this evening. But before we start, and I disappear, this is just to remind you that this event is being recorded and that you can participate in the discussion at the end of the lecture by sending questions and comments to us using the Q&A panel on your screens. So over to you, Claire. And Piranesi at the BSR, Thomas Ashby's curious Campo Marzio. Claire. Thank you so much, Valerie. I'm just going to share the screen. Okay, and I'm going to disappear myself now. Okay, thank you so much to the director of the BSR, Chris Wickham, to Harriet O'Neill, assistant director, and of course, to Valerie Scott, who has so often helped my work over many years and who suggested the idea of a Piranesi highlight on the new website of the digital collections of the library and archive. In terms of Piranesi studies, I am perching with some hesitation on the shoulders of giants. I don't quite know how I dare to venture here in such depth as I have done. I hope not out of my depth, but as many people know, Piranesi has real allure, especially to an 18th century specialist who is in love with Rome and topography. So the Campo Marzio is a natural place for me to end up. The giants in the world of Piranesi and Campo Marzio matters that I am referring to are, I am delighted to say, my friends and colleagues, Mario Bevilacqua, Joseph Connors, Heather Heidminer, and Susanna Pasquali. To them and all who have helped me in this work, I would like to say a warm thank you. During this talk, I will use the Italian title of the volume, but as you can see here, it had a Latin title as well. And in the volume's correct form, as it were, 
the languages are on facing pages in the text. The long essay, which makes up a large part of the folio volume, around 40 pages of text, text and indices, is also in both languages. My plan in this talk is to introduce Piranesi briefly, very briefly, and his archaeological interests, then turn to the Campo Marzio volume, look at the connection with Robert Adam that came about due to their shared concern with archaeology, and then I will examine the curiosities of the BSR copy, and lastly, look at the map in some detail. After the presentation, as Valerie mentioned, I will be showing a little bit of the BSR Digital Collections website, which is hosting the Campo Marzio as a highlight. This image is the title page of the BSR copy. I will be mostly using images from that copy, but also the Academia di San Luca copy. Who was Piranesi? Here he is in a portrait for the frontispiece of his magnum opus, in terms of size at least, Le Antiquita Romane. Why would he choose to be depicted in this way? It is a presentation of himself as an antique bust, a ruin in fact. His Venetian origin is mentioned in the inscription, as is his status as architect, but without the usual architectural tools on show. Instead, there is a book, he was a maker of books, of topographical and archaeological printed and illustrated volumes. The question of identity is fundamental for him and where he stood in relation to clients and fellow artists. He formed strong links with Britain. He enjoyed a bitter rivalry with French architects and antiquarians. Piranesi is a true 18th century man, which is like Renaissance man, only more so with the admixture of new factors, the spread of the empirical scientific method into the public sphere, the expansion of international travel and trade, the growth of the nation state, and a more decided turn against religion as the fabric holding society together. He was a phenomenon also known to be so in his lifetime as an artist, very general term, but everything he did was art and in his personal character, in short, a protean figure. The publication of Camere Sepulcrali, burial, burial Chambers, 1750, reveals his early archaeological interests. This print illustrates his new way of interpreting and describing visually the remains of the antique past using stylistic techniques influenced, influenced by the theatre stage designs of the Baroque era and the space creating or exaggerating theory of Shana per Angulo or diagonal composition. Note the lengthy, lengthy caption with an explanation of the image. With Peronesi, writing always is incorporated into the image, often invading the picture space, overlaying onto it, masquerading as inscriptions. The image itself is never enough for him is always developed and expanded by the use of text with its historical as well as archaeological content. We will see how much textual sources mattered to him and how he added to the record with his own investigations and analyses via the texts he included in his plates. The publication of Le Antiquita in 1756 was an event on a European scale and earned him widespread fame. He had orders for volumes from as far as Russia and it earned him membership of the Society of Antiquaries of London. Piranesi was aware of the challenge it posed to the way in the ancient world was examined. In his preface, which is largely aimed at architects, he states his intention to illustrate in his prints the state, both in plan and section and view, of the ancient remains in order that they may be better informed as to precise forms. And this is a theme that he will often return to in his career, particularly when, about seven years later, he produced what some of his contemporaries considered to be the ravings of a fevered imagination in his plan of the Campo Marzio. Here he is an architect working through archaeology, for the education and, no pun intended, 
edification of other architects. In this map image collage, he uses the fragments of the famous marble plan of ancient Rome in one of his most characteristic techniques of trompe l'oeil, combining various levels of depiction, playing with inscriptions in various forms, turning the paper surface from an incised and inked sheet into a carved stone. The marble plan was to play a key role in many of his archeological investigations and was central to the underlying source material employed for the Campo Marzio map. In this spectacular fantasy, there are hidden clues to a relationship which was the key, was to be key to the creation and completion of the Campo Marzio. The Via Appia, of course, was and is aligned with tombs, and this volume of the Antiquita is concerned with tombs. So Piranesi takes an epigraphic opportunity to acknowledge his Scottish friends and companions, Robert Adam and Alan Ramsey. Together in Rome, they went on archaeological visitations around the place, also to Hadrian's Villa for drawing and measuring. Alan Ramsey's memorial appears on the right above the milestone, while Adam is hidden away on the left in the dark area below the relief with Romulus and the wolf. Adam's inscription, which is too difficult to read um, from this slide, is of course in Latin and is modeled on the usual text for ancient tombs with dis manibus to the gods and spirits. And then the translation reads to Robert Adam, the Scotsman, the most talented architect, Giovanni Battista Piranesi had this set up. Piranesi identified closely with his role as an antiquarian after his election to the London Society. Three of his title pages shown here the Magnificenza, like Campo Marzio, had a dual language title page and text, are presented in terms of ancient epigraphy, suggesting the importance of the statement, permanence, and of course, emulation of the ancient world. He is advertising the British honor for its own prestige and in order to encourage wider British sales for his books. The story of the Campo Marzio in the BSR Rare Books collection begins here with Thomas Ashby on the right, former director of the British School at Rome. He was the first student at BSR in 1902, then honorary librarian, assistant director and director until 1925. Here are two photographs from the Italian front on the north, in the north of Italy, um, specifically around Asiago, near Vicenza from where he wrote a letter about the Campo Marzio to the Burlington magazine in 1918, sent from the British military mission Commando Supremo Italian Expeditionary Force, following the publication of a catalogue raisonné of the Prince of Piranesi by the French scholar Henri Faucillon. And in the letter, he pointed out some mistakes and omissions by Faucillon, which we will look at shortly. As a Quaker, Ashby chose not to enlist as a combatant, so he served as an ambulance driver. Eugenie Strong, the librarian and deputy, main, remained in Rome and ran the BSR in his absence. He returned from time to time and clearly, while on duty even, had the leisure to engage in scholarly discussion. Such intellectual energy was typical of him. He was a marvel in many ways and deserves to be called the founding father of the British School at Rome. And thanks to him, the library is enormously rich in wonderful rare books, maps, and happily, some Piranesi books and prints. Among them were two copies of the Campo Marzio. The one we're going to look at today had belonged to the printmaker, artist, and collector dealer, Luigi Rossini, who lived later than Piranesi into the mid 19th century. As Ashby mentions in that letter to the Burlington magazine, he also owned another copy, which was unbound. There are a lot of anomalies in both copies, missing prints, adding added prints. And I go into some detail in this in my essay for the highlight on the digital collections website. As there are two copies of the book, so there are two Campo Marzio maps at BSR. Both have been separated from the books in which they were originally included. One is framed and hangs in the director's office, lucky director, and the other is in the library. 
I can summarize now the genesis of this volume and the map, my account is indebted to the work of Susanna Pasquale. Things began with the Antiquita Romane volumes, which we mentioned. The idea was to produce a map as part of that. Then it became a separate map, and then eventually a book with an included map. The project as it unfolded is complex, which has been examined with new evidence added in recent years. In many ways, it is a sort of story of dedications, the cancelled one of the Antiquita as a whole to the Irish nobleman Lord Charlemont that got Piranesi into such a state. Then one of the Campo Marzio to an unnamed cardinal that was set aside and then offered to Robert Adam, the newly arrived visitor, eager to learn from Piranesi about the ancient architecture of Rome in order to his, inform his architectural practice and to acquire kudos in the British world of arts and letters where, as we have seen, Piranesi was well known and admired. Adam had a rivalry going on, well, with most other architects, but especially with William Chambers, who had been in Rome, but didn't spend time learning from Piranesi. And most importantly, did not get a map and then a whole book dedicated to him. Piranesi was keen on the dedication for marketing using reasons, selling his books and prints in Britain and Adam paid him for the dedication, although he tried to cover this up, as we will see. This map of Piranesi's vision of the area of ancient Rome, north of the ancient center, is justly one of his most famous prints, and Adam was present during its creation. Many of the Adam letters speak about him visiting the studio workshop of Piranesi while it was being produced. The map is very large, about 1.5 meters, not quite square, made up of several plates joined together, listed as plates five to 10 of the completed volume. It was included as a fold out, making it obviously very fragile. The map looks confusing at first sight, but each of the areas and structures that are included in it adhere closely to rules of symmetry. So what was this area called the Campo Marzio? The evidence is mostly from written sources with not much help given on topography. There were tombs, villas with garden areas, areas for military exercises, a gathering place for the tribes to vote, etc. There are almost no houses shown. Piranesi's aim was to continue the Severan mar marble plan, the former Urbis, and his former colleague Giambattista Nolli's map of Rome northwards outside the walls. Piranesi clearly identified in Adam someone who'd be willing to carry out some of his ideas into actual buildings. In a text announcing the publication of the map that Susanna Pasquale has published, um, some text, a piece of writing, anonymous but probably by Piranesi himself, reveals that the purpose of it was to inspire young architects and provide material for them to fuel their imagination and help them feel confident about using ideas that might seem outrageous to more timid architects because the authority, as he referred to it, of the classical past, as shown in his map, would support them. Adam admitted to skepticism in letters about much of the theory behind Piranesi's creation, but he extracted from the project the important dedication which would impress um, potential clients of his and was heavily influenced by it. Mario Bevelacqua has suggested that the text of this volume was drafted once the concept became that of a book with plates at the end and a series of maps and was written by the Jesuit priest and scholar Conduccio Conducci. Here I am showing the approbatio or approval for publication page from the Accademia di San Luca copy of the volume um, signed, as you can see, by Contucci, Contucci sorry, which we can, um, the San Luca copy, we can consider the gold standard of editions and copies of the volume in that the pagination is regular, it is a first edition, it is in perfect condition. I was lucky enough to see this in Rome in February and we'll be checking the Vatican copies on my next visit to see the pr precise makeup of those books. Some of the Campo Marzio material at the Vatican, 
once belonged to the Thomas Ashby collection at the British School at Rome and was sold by his widow to the Vatican Library, along with a very important collection of drawings and watercolours, primarily topographical in subject. Just a note, side note about this Academia di San Luca copy, it is not one of the set of volumes given to the Academy Library by Piranesi when he was elected a member of the Academy. Since that happened in March of the same year, 1761, and this volume at Campo Marzio wasn't yet ready. I will read an extract from a revealing letter written by Adam to his sister, Janet, in London, with details about how the dedication came about. He says, I am going out tomorrow morning, being Sunday, on a party of antiquity, hunting with Piranesi, Clarichot, and Pecheur, my three friends, cronies, and instructors. You will soon see my name in print, as Piranesi has absolutely rejected the cardinal he intended to dedicate his plan of ancient Rome to, and has dedicated it to me under the name of architect friend and most knowing in and lover of the antique. As his character is extremely high amongst all connoisseurs, it cannot miss to give all of them in England and Scotland a vast notion of me as one deserving so much regard and such compliment from Piranesi who never flattered nor never praised unless when the person deserved it. There are many people here and in different countries would have given him a present of 100 or 150 pounds for this dedication, so that in preferring me, he neglects his own interests, which is the first time he was ever known guilty of that virtue, as he ever loved money more than merit. This fancy of his will oblige me to buy 80 or 100 copies of his plan, which I will send secretly to England and Scotland to be disposed of and I beg no mention may be made of this thing to any living soul until the plan itself appear, as people would think I had bribed him to do what I'm sure I never dreamt of till I was told I must allow him, he would take no refusal. So that's the, the background. These are the dedication pages of the book. I show these pages with Piranesi's letter of dedication, and you can see the beginning of the letter, which are missing from the BSR copy. So again, these are from the San Luca copy. There seems no doubt that we can hear Piranesi's own voice in this letter. They were friends, and he writes as such. Note the headpiece images. These were particularly influential on Adam. The general sarcophagus theme was taken up in his furniture design. And here, just as a quick example, is uh, one of a set of beautiful benches from Kedleston Hall, one of the first projects he designed on return from Rome, um, interior design and architecture. And here's the end of the dedication letter. Piranesi defends his position here as empirical archaeologist and antiquarian scholar with a certain amount of the requisite false modesty appropriate for such texts and he mentions how he and Adam work together and speaks of their friendship. The important section in yellow here reveals how insistent Piranesi was of the authority of the ancient writers to back up his ideas and it is interesting to note the Masonic style greeting at the end, vivete sano, this shared interest in Freemasonry was an important link for Piranesi with his English supporters, such as the antiquarian Thomas Hollis. Before leaving Adam, I would like to make a couple of specific points comparing some drawings made by him in Rome with the Campo Marzio, inspired by the, this page, the last sheet in the volume. By coincidence, it is this very sheet which provides the most interesting of the curiosities of the BSR copy of the Campo Marzio. Plate 48. The center image of the three little views shows Piranesi's reconstruction of a part of ancient Rome, the area surrounding the Pantheon, not far from the riverbank, and located by Piranesi here 
in a misreading of the sources apparently, is the Stagnum Agrippi. He's included a very enchanting spina down the center of the basin or reservoir, an elaborate water feature with many obelisks and columns, perhaps implying use as a boat race course. Adam must have seen that small view in the making and it clearly inspired him. The effect of, on him of his proximity to Piranesi were that his own drawings became more bold and imaginative in spatial concept, particularly in the combining of a variety of geometric forms around a central axis. He employs here in the top drawing, the bird's eye perspective, which is unique for him. None other of his drawings outside this group uses this technique. The inclusion of ponds with porticos around is clearly inspired by the Piranesi Stagnum Agrippi, also the charming little boats uh, visible on the bottom right. The project he had in mind in these drawings was a crazy Piranesian level ambitious scheme to rebuild the city of Lisbon after the cataclysmic earthquake of November the 1st, 1755 which was perhaps the first natural event to be very quickly reported all over Europe and beyond in newspapers. As we know, there was an earthquake, tsunami, uh, massive loss of life and uh, destruction of the city. Shocks were reported as far away as Scotland. Not surprisingly, as he was unknown in Portugal and in still in many ways a student of architecture, Adam's ideas remained in his head and on paper. And here we have his bird's eye overview of the planned rebuilding. This is one of the over 600 Adam Brothers drawings bought by Sir John Soane, the architect, and now in his museum um, in London and uh, visible on the Soane Museum website. Here, the boundary wall in the Piranesi view on the left, englobing a corner building with a thermal window opening above a column and lintel entrance have clearly been taken up by Adam on the right, as has the open roof of the amphitheater of Statilius Taurus, which is another of the views from the three view plate. Actually, scholars are not sure of the location of this amphitheater. Perhaps it could have been nearer the Tiber than where Piranesi puts it. These drawings, reveal that Adam's ambition, emboldened and fired by Piranesi's boundless confidence and in clear imitation of his bird's eye viewpoint in the small views, enabled him to turn the monumental aspect of the riverside city of Rome into ideas for the monumental center of the estuary city of Lisbon. Leaving Adam to one side, we can now focus on the BSR copy plate 48. And here it is, as you can see, made up of three plates and they show isometric views, bird's eye views, and are unlike any other in the Campo Marzio, apart from the second frontispiece, which we will also examine. All the other plates in the volume, mostly grouped together after the text, show smaller maps and view reconstructions or architectural sections of various structures in the ancient Campo Marzio. This sheet is in fact a remnant of the original map project. And thanks to Susanna Pasquale, we now know that Piranesi intended to surround that big map with views like these three. And here is the reconstruction of that idea. Pasquale worked out there would have been 18 small views of this type to complete the frame around the map. And this is the bottom left hand corner adjacent to the Tiber Island. The measurements of the plates have been done, it fits, and this is the section of the map, of course, that shows the structures shown in those views. The Greuter map from the 17th century that was made up with flanking views and indices all round, as you can see in this um, slide, which is a, a deconstruction, as it were, of the Greuter map, um, pub, which was, has recently been published by Mario Bevilacqua, would have been a model for Piranesi's illustrated map idea. This slide is the heart of the matter. And what made me very surprised when I first started to study the BSR copy last year, it has three plate 48s. Rather disappointingly for me, in his 1918 letter from the front, Thomas Ashby does not mention this repetition. 
He notes the Pyrenees scholars Hind and Faucillon in their catalogues of the prints published in 1914 and 18 respectively, do not mention the in existence of a version of the Campo Marzio in Italian only. So he assumes this copy dates from later than 1762. With the help of Beatrice Gelozia, the deputy librarian at BSR, I have identified that the normal version of the plate on the left, which was inserted into the Ashby volume in the wrong place, but is printed on a different size sheet from the rest of the book, in fact comes from that second copy of the Campo Marzio that Ashby owned, the unbound one mentioned in his letter. Other Campo Marzio sheets of the same size as this sheet 48 are in the BSR collection. The other two plates, the one in the middle and the one on the right, were the biggest surprise when I came across them both together at the end of the volume, which is the correct location for plate 48. I first thought that I was seeing things. As you can see, in all three, the images are in different order. The plate number 48 itself, one plate number for all three images, is on the theatre's print at at the top right in the normal one. So this moves around the sheet with its print. This anomaly may indicate that the variations were trials for arrangement of the plates on the sheet. I tried to think about why and came up with an answer. I do hope you're following me here because it's a bit complicated. I came to the conclusion that the normal order of plates on the sheet and why that was adopted as a standard was because the order of the three images from top to bottom proceeds in the natural way of reading text on a page. And this is echoed again by the natural left to right movement as we read the map, taking the Tiber on the left extremity of the map as a starting point for moving the eye across the map and inwards to the right, away from the river. So we come first to the theatres, then the Pantheon, then the amphitheater. And that's the order of the views in the sheet from the top to the bottom. I've tried out this hypothesis on a couple of my expert friends and they didn't burst out laughing. So for the moment, I'm sticking with it. In general terms, since as far as I'm aware, no other edition examined and published by Piranesi scholars is like this Italian only one at BSR with its many anomalies, principally this anomaly, I suggested to, is yes, later than 1762 and could have been created as a special to order edition for a client who didn't want or need the Latin text. The impressions in this edition are mostly high quality with dark ink and it is quite unlike the Italian only version produced after Giambattista's death by Francesco Piranesi in 1783, which has the text set into small type in three narrow columns per page and opens with a new dedication to the King of Sweden, Francesco's patron at the time. But that doesn't explain the two plate 48s at the end with the different arrangements of the views. Another interesting feature of these views is little numbers dotted all over the three of them. They give us another indication that the views had a previous life separate from the book, since although there are several indices included in the book, giving information about the structures to be found in the various maps, these numbers here are nowhere referenced. One can hypothesize an index identifying the objects in these three views running along the bottom of the map or around the edge in the same way as in the Greuter map we saw a moment ago. These little numbers are similar to the way Piranesi used numbers in his Vedute, his Vedute di Roma prints. Here I show his San Giovanni in Laterano with numbers indicating features which are then below listed in the key with, uh, with the caption. The other plate with bird's eye view treatment is this one, now the second title page. If we follow Pasquale's now proven hypothesis, as I think we must, this would have been another view framing the map located on the left-hand edge, just above the, one, the sheet with the three little views, which we've just been looking at. 
And on the right here, I show the relevant section of the map covering the area in the view. And then the blue area is obviously the blue area of the view, uh, is the area of the view, excuse me. There are no little numbers to be found here. So it would seem that this view plate was made and then used in an adapted form as the second title page when the idea of turning the map into a whole book arose, perhaps after a discussion with Contucci, or perhaps it was a decision based on an issue of how to market the map and view combination, because the map is large. And with those views around it, it would be even larger, very less easy, much less easy to sell as a huge sheet. Giovanna Scaloni, in her close examination of all the Piranesi plates held in the Calcografia collection in Rome, has shown that the copper plate is heavily abraded in the section on the lower right, which carries the inscription, indicating cancellation and alteration of the surface to be printed from, supporting the hypothesis that it was one of the flanking views. With this examination, it can be seen how odd the BSR copy of Campo Marzio is, and yet the oddity should not be considered as merely recondite bibliographic footnotes. That sheets could be added and or taken out, that matters of cost might influence a client to request a specific form for their copy, or that Piranesi or one of his assistants could be playing around with plates and sheets. As one project melted into another, as was the case with the Campo Marzio map edition that became the book edition. We shall see, as we shall see below, the mobility of the constituent parts could create many new juxtapositions and reveals much about Piranesi's bookmaking practice and the world of illustrated books in general in the mid 18th century. So let's take a quick look at the Campo Marzio map itself and put into context the archaeological investigations and hypotheses that Piranesi undertook in its making, as he vaunted in his dedicatory preface to Adam. This slide here on the left is a screenshot from the wonderful Nolly app available for iPhones and iPads, etc. Showing approximately the area of what we would call the long Campo Marzio, extending almost as far as the Ponte Milvio at the top. You can see from the Prati area beyond the Vatican in the Nolli, there was plenty of empty space for Piranesi to play with. I have ro rotated the screenshot from the app to mimic the orientation that P Piranesi used for his Campo Marzio. So that's obviously the, the map there in the top right, um, which he has packed full of structures. So focusing on what we might know, familiarity, we should note the tiny size respect to, to the other structures of the ancient city of things that we know. Um, this one is the Teatro di Marcello and the Portico of Ottavia. His, anti, um, his antiquarian speculations are enormous in comparison with them. Professor Joe Connors's book on the missing Corso has been fundamental to my learning about the map. So I illustrate here this puzzle, the Via del Corso, of course a road that existed in ancient time, is almost banished from the map. It very oddly wanders around towards the lower slope of the Pinchin Hill, as you can see from the pink lines. One of the influences for Piranesi for his plan, apart from the Severan marble plan and the Nolli map, is the Piro Ligorio map, of which I show a detail here of the area near the mausoleum of Hadrian. Connors notes that the overcrowding of the city in the Ligorio as a for, uh, notes it as a forerunner of Piranesi. And he uses a wonderful phrase to describe these maps. They are maxi interpolated texts dense webs of buildings placed according to sources or hypotheses. Ligorio's positioning of some structures he knew about from the literature was rejected by Piranesi who came up with his own ideas. His Campo Marzio map is not bird's eye like Ligorio's, though we can sense Piranesi's desire 
to provide something like this in his creation of the little images, the flanking images, and um, also the what is now the second title page. So I thought that I would have a look for what's familiar in unfamiliar territory in the um, vast Campo Marzio that Piranesi created. Um, so the pink dot is where I reckon the BSR would be on the edge of what is now Monte Parioli. And um, I've highlighted it there in a close up and it's a military exercises building, very appropriate for the BSR. So to conclude, how mad was Piranesi being in his map and his imagining of the appearance and size of the buildings? Here on the right, sorry, left, I show a detail which is the gradient at the edge of the Pincio, looking south over the valley near what is Via Veneto, so that's the bottom of the blue line. And I've outlined this structure, this is all one structure essentially of um, some sort of palace with, with um, terraces and um, staircases and so on. Piranesi makes this the location of the vast terrace and substructures jutting out from the edge of the hillside, steps that lead up to the palace complex, all very fantastical, but moving to the right-hand side of the screen, in a brilliant BSR lecture on April the 7th, Professor Paolo Carafa, and here he is, bottom right of the Sapienza introduced some results of the first phase of new excavations and investigations on the edge of the Palatine around the house of Augustus. The discoveries of evidence of walls and doors at various levels and the detail on the right of his slide is a doorway below the church of Santa Anastasia are leading his team at the moment to conclusions that there would have been a very large terrace supported on substructures at this point on the edge of the Palatine towards the Cerco Massimo, and that its appearance could have been as shown in this hypothetical reconstruction. Well, frankly, this is not at all unlike Piranesi in the Campo Marzio, so maybe he was not mad at all. By the by, the blue dot on the Campo Marzio map shows a quasi rectangular area which is labelled plebeian housing. I have been looking at this map for at least a year and it's the first time I've seen any houses for ordinary people. And here we can see that archeologists now, in our time, are using a combination of physical evidence and literary sources, exactly as Piranesi did. I am not saying that the Sapienza Palatine team are 100% correct because that is certainly not for me to judge, but Piranesi is not 100% wrong either. So I hope that this Claire? Claire, we can't hear you. Claire, are you there? She's still there. Claire, can you hear us? Okay. Well, let's just, well, I hope you can hear me, Claire, but thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I hope if we get you back, you will be able to uh, show us the, um, the highlights from the BSR digital collections. Um, we, we, there we are, this is back. <laughs> we lost you, Claire, for a, for a moment. Glad to see you back. I just, I don't know if you heard me, I was just thanking you for a wonderful talk um, and to say that um, we um, will be taking questions, we won't be taking questions now. Um, because you are going to um, show us um, um, the, high, the new highlight, which we're very excited about, that has been launched today on our BSR Digital Collections website. Um, and after that, we will be taking um, some questions. 
So if anyone would like to send some questions while um, Claire is showing that, and then we'll come back to questions at the end. Claire, you're muted. You're muted, Claire. You're muted, Claire. Can you just unmute yourself? Yes, okay, is that it? That's it, lovely. <laughs> um, thank you, Valerie. And um, yes, so here we are. I will, uh, I've moved on to the browser. So this is the, um, this is the homepage of the BSR Digital Collections website. And the images that fly by are some of the delights that are in the collections. And I'm just going to go down and you'll see that these are the highlights that are currently available for study. You can see where I got um, the Ashby photo photograph from. And here we let's go to the Piranesi. So essentially what, what's going on here is um, that we've divided this into various sections. And I have to say this, this work is certainly not me in the sense that I wrote the research essay and with Valerie and Beatrice we've collaborated on um, on putting this together for the for the highlight and it's also other people's work is involved as I will explain so essentially we're able to go to my essay um, so I'm not going to put I'm not going to stress it but I'm just going to flip through briefly and you'll see that there I am going into quite a lot of detail about all of the oddities, the pages missing and so forth. Then is the section where I focus on plate 48 and obviously bibliography. So that's kind of the research essay. Then the section is um, the volume which has been um, digitized courtesy of the Hertziana. And I'm just going to turn a few pages in the volume um, and see if I can zoom in. I think I can. Yeah. That is the um, book plate of Thomas Ashby. And I have to go back. And essentially it presents the book as it is. And this is an absolutely new thing as far as I know anyway for Piranesi on the web is that Normally you can find, um, you can find scans of, of, the, um, of the etchings, but the text is always left out. It's, you know, it's just considered not to be important. So you can go in there and, um, and read it, which is fabulous. And after the volume, so then the etchings, um, the etch plates are, take you to a different section of the, um, digital collections website where, okay, let's just pick this one for example. Um, the full bibliographical record is included for each one of the images and these are fully zoomable. You can uh, move around in them. Let me just try and make sure that I can move. Yeah, and you can go right in there. So, I mean, it's a kind of amazing way of being able to come really close up to Piranesi and it's going to be a completely new way I think of people being able to work on this material so that's wonderful and the um, the last section is uh, nothing to do with me but I'm going to show it to you anyway um, and as you can see from the brief in introduction there is um, essentially the conservation of the volume for the BSR was undertaken in Brindisi and there was an exhibition there and uh, Luigia, who, has, who was the restorer working on the uh, copy, has put together this section here showing all the various phases of her work on the book. And then these rather amazing, I'm not sure if this is going to come through online, but um, sort of before and after um, views of, of the volume. Let me just move that one if I can. It seems to have frozen. Anyway, so that's kind of um, worth exploring and explains a little bit about the amount of work that goes into any one of these sort of um, rare books that need to be worked on, which there is a lot, I think, at BSR. So I will just stop sharing the screen now so we can um, 
Thank you, Claire. Thank you. And so I hope you'll um, all go and have a look and have an explore. All the um, images are zoomable. Um, and so you can get up, up really close um, to all the pages and all the etchings and engravings. And um, I think this is a great, for me, this is a wonderful, um, a wonderful project um, that Claire's done. Um, and it's one example, I'm sure, of many, many um, possibilities of research projects working on our uh, Rare Books collection, which Claire knows very well. Claire's done a lot of work on our collection of early guidebooks to Rome. And I think you'd agree, Claire, that there are a lot of um, very interesting research possibilities in, in our Rare Books library. Is that right? Yeah, I would say that um, in my many years, happy to say, experience of, of working um, in association with the British School is that in the library, there's a um, huge amount of undiscovered treasure. And um, there's just like a huge amount of material. And particularly uh, valuable are the guidebooks. And that's a famous collection that you've got, um, Valerie, is the, the guidebooks and the maps. And again, we, we can thank um, Thomas Ashby for having put all, all of that together. But there's certainly an awful lot of material available for people to work on. Absolutely. And we would really like to encourage people to, to come to the BSR and to study our collection. Um, and uh, it is all catalogued and online on our, on our, um, on our, um, uh, our catalogue, on our Urbis uh, network. Um, and we would be delighted for people to actually come and, and, and work, on, uh, work on our collection and to, to do research. And I think this possibility of um, these highlights, um, this is our old uh, BSR um, uh, digital collections website that has been um, moved onto a new platform. Um, the work of um, our archivist, Alessandro Jovenko, um, and we have this possibility now of, um, of including these highlights, which uh, is a wonderful way of um, illustrating the research that's done on our collections uh, and also um, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very, very nice kind of uh, research output. And it does show what digital humanities can do and what, how it can contribute to, to research. So um, there don't seem to be any questions, Claire. So um, <laughs> I, think, I think we can, um, again, thank you very, oh no, here we are. Oh, <laughs> there's, there's lots of, lots of questions, lots of, uh, oh, here we are, here we, here's one. No, lots of, lots of, uh, what a brilliant talk, great work. Lo lo lots thank of you. those. <laughs> and here's, and here's one. Um, I noticed that the views of buildings that you showed to follow the map from left to right are actually taken from different viewpoints, some looking west and others looking east along this axis. Do the viewpoints have any significance? I think that that, that is actually, um, I made a whole slide about viewpoints and then I took it out because I thought it was essentially too, a bit too confusing because I still haven't quite worked out for myself um, if the various angles that he takes on the Pantheon and on the amphitheatre. The, the amphitheatre is taken from the back, as it, as it were, from the um, eastern side of Rome, looking the other in the other direction. I haven't worked out whether or not they um, mean anything or whether it's it's simply perhaps the, the most attractive view or the most appealing visually, I don't know. But um, viewpoint, yeah, the viewpoint is really important. I think the viewpoint of the mausoleum of Hadrian, uh, the Bustum Hadriani, the, the one that's used for the second, for the second um, a frontispiece is particularly interesting because it seems to be like a, a view right down and along the bridge that connects across the Tiber. So yes, viewpoints, I've, is kind of my next um, my next puzzle to try and find something more about that. Another question here, perhaps this might be one for me. Do you happen to know where Ashby acquired his Piranesi volumes and did he keep records of his acquisitions? 
to my knowledge, well, he may have done, but we don't have them. Uh, what's very interesting, sadly not in, in, in this volume, um, in, in many of the books that he purchased that um, have come to the BSR, uh, he very often on his book plates that he put, uh, he stuck in the front of the, of the book, he would annotate that with usually where he bought the book, uh, the date, how much he paid for it. And then often around the, um, the, the book plates, there are actually his, his little notes about which, uh, which plates were missing or bibliographic details or, um, it, and it does show that, I mean, the interesting thing about Ashby as a collector is that he was collecting these books for his research. And so each of these books he would study in great depth and detail. And he would make these little annotations at the beginning of them, at the beginning of the books. Um, but I, uh, we don't have, there's never been a list. I mean, we're trying to recreate his library um, when, when we catalogued all the books online. Um, and we are, in fact, you can find them, um, a, a list of them on our, uh, it's called search, if you look for search, um, which is our cataloging um, system. And we have actually put on there a list of all the books that he, that he gave us. Um, so I think, uh, um, I think that, I hope that answers, answers your question. Lots and lots, Claire, of wonderful, clear and fascinating talk. Enjoyed it tremendously. So it's fantastic. Another question here. Can you please tell us more about Piranesi's election as a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London, as shown on the title page? Well, yes, um, I know a little bit about it. Um, I got elected fellow of Society of Antiquaries of London, um, one of the great reasons for doing that, well, for wanting to do that is because you join a society which has Piranesi, Cardinal Albani and jo 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 Joachim Winkelmann as members as well. So that was kind of cool. And when I was doing some research on Winkelmann um, in the library and archive at the Society of Antiquaries, I came across the letter of thanks um, that in fact has been published um, already by Silvia Gavuzzo Stewart of a uh, letter of thanks in Latin that Piranesi wrote to the society. Um, uh, and he sent it via Thomas Hollis. Um, Thomas Hollis is a sort of eminence grise behind all of the kind of grand tourists and the artists and the relationship between Piranesi and Hollis and Thomas Jenkins, the dealer. It's a very interesting one, which still needs to be clarified. So essentially the idea was it, um, Jenkins proposed to Hollis that Piranesi was a person that should be recognized as um, by a fellowship. And so uh, it was agreed at a meeting in, in London and the letter went out again via Hollis and Jenkins to Piranesi and he replied in this um, very nice formal Latin uh, letter of thanks, which is kept in the, in the archive. And just as he did when he was elected to the Academia di San Luca, he gave a gift. So he gave a volume um, of one of his illustrated volumes to the library at the society, which is, um, which is still there. So they picked him because he was, you know, the man of the moment, essentially. And quite a lot of these, um, I think these decisions were driven by a desire to um, expand the society's activities to englobe all of the Englishmen who are Englishmen and Scotsmen who were working in Rome as dealers and, um, and merchants and artists, and sort of to make a really strong bridge between um, Rome and London on that basis. Um, it was a period of time for the society when it was very Italophile, very focused on, on antiquities um, that were being discovered in Rome. But then the focus, in fact, it was a deliberate decision on their part, the focus moved away um, and returned to um, local antiquities, as it were, you know, British, uh, British antiquities, uh, which is where, where it has remained ever since. Thank you, Claire. Another one here, um, a question. To what extent do you think that adding the floor plan style alongside the bird's eye 
in these specific instances changes the kinds of experience and interpretation a reader is nudged towards for the urban texture more broadly? And there's a second question, how transformative is the addition of those technical and frame-breaking meta-texts in effect for the wider reality effect Piranesi is playing with? Well, to, to take the second point, I mean, yes, it, it completely transforms. I mean, you know, one can only speak from um, experience as a reader and scholar. And when we read Piranesi now, and when I say read is, to be quite honest, we don't read his texts so much, you know, not those long texts, which are speculations of um, uh, the sources and locations of buildings and so on. Um, but we read his texts that are embedded within the images and we interpret them to, in that way. So they transform our experience of looking at the images, that's for sure, and um, make them into many layered. Uh, our response becomes much richer because of the many layers that Piranesi deliberately weaves in to each one of the images with all of these things. And I think that in terms of combining a, a um, in, in the Campo Marzio, combining the bird's eye view, as he does with those three little views and the second frontispiece, with more normal views at the back, and then with different sorts of maps as well, which um, I hope people explore on the, um, on the highlight, um, not only the big Campo Marzio plan itself, of which I've got a tiny little photograph on my wall behind, not just that map, but um, there are other maps too of um, different parts of the Campo Marzio. All, all, of these, all of these different ways of looking at the same object or the same structure, so looking at it in plan and looking at it in section, obviously, in the, in the more traditional views at the back of the book, and then bird's eye views and uh, views in which uh, inscriptions are overlaid on top of, um, on top of maps and on top of views. So I think, yes, it's, I mean, those points are, I think I probably haven't said this so clearly, but I think it's a, a very complex and rich experience. And um, I think more can be done, not more, more, I should have done more, but I haven't seen all the volumes yet. So I'm really trying to, I'm really trying to tackle still the, the bibliographical aspect, which is, I'm desperate to find out if the Vatican copies have any, any other copy anywhere. So if anybody's familiar with a copy in a library in America, for example, that I don't know about, and that you know that there, there's a copy of the Campo Marzio, could you please go and see if it has two or three plate 48s book, and then send me an email because I'll be very excited. Lovely. Well, thank you, Claire. That was a fantastic lecture. And um, it's been a wonderful um, um, evening. Um, so thank you very much indeed, and I'm very grateful to you for having done all this work on one of our one of our treasures. And thank you, Ashby, for all the wonderful things you've left <laughs> in our collection. <laughs> for eight and a half thousand photographs to to prints and engravings and maps, and I mean it's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And we are very very lucky to 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 have such a wonderful resource. So I will end now and say goodbye to everybody and thank you for joining us this evening. And thank you, Claire, very much for your talk. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Bye-bye.